everyone enjoy. Matthew, welcome. Yes. Thanks so much, and uh, take it away. Ew. We'll be in the in the background if you need us. Okay. Okay. Hi, I'm Matthew. Unconsciousness and incompetence, tracing and traversing roots, roots, ruts, and rules in learning and teaching. I'm coming to you from Boston. Boston, uh, home of many things, lots of sports, lots of universities, lots of immigrants, languages. I, I checked wiki, Spanish, lots of Portuguese, lots of Chinese, <coughs> French, Creole, lots of Haitians, Italians, of course, the Irish, though a lot of Boston, Boston Irish and no longer speak Gaelic, Russian, Vietnamese, all kinds of diverse languages in Boston. See if I can change a slide. Oh, here we go. Yes. Okay, task one. How many ways can you combine the four words below? Type them in the chat box. You notice two are adjectives, two are nouns. So you're going to make some combinations like that. Two word combos is what we're looking for. Conscious competence. What else we got? Conscious incompetence. Yes. Throw them up, throw them up. Unconscious competence. We're getting there, we're getting there. These are the answers. You guys are on point. Unconscious incompetence, conscious competence, unconscious competence, conscious incompetence. Yes, we're dealing, we're working with these words. Almost like poetry. Let's have Psych read this in a different language. What are we talking about? Conscious. Conscious. I'm conscious of something. I know that it exists. I know about it in some way. So, I know it, I know about it. Unconscious is not knowing that something exists, not knowing about it. Down to the bottom, competence, knowing to do something, knowing that I can, must, need to, knowing to do, and knowing how to do. Incompetence, not knowing to do something, not knowing how to do something. When we're talking about incompetence, we're not being judgmental. We're not being evaluative. This is a neutral, descriptive word that we're going to be working with. These all together describe skill. These are used to describe what's the one way to look at the elements of skill. We need to know about it, and we need to know how to do it. Then we have a skill. What we're going to be talking about is skill in terms of teaching and learning. And teaching and learning together as essentially one thing. The skill of teaching and learning, the skill of learning and teaching, the skill of teaching learning, the skill of learning teaching. So it applies all around. So task number two. If these are four steps in a process, we call it a ladder, in what order you think they might go. What's step one at the bottom, moving up to step two, moving up to step three, moving up to step four in terms of a skill acquisition development process? Type in the chat box and you can use the first letter of each one. So if you think CC is the first step, and uh, that would be conscious competence, CC, right? CC, comma, UC, comma, CI, comma, UI or in any order you think it might go. The first one being the bottom rung of the ladder going up to build a skill. All right, we've got the first two folks on the board and let's see if they got it right. Is that right? Yeah, that's the way it goes. Four steps of the skills acquisition ladder. So it's pretty interesting to me because we start with unconscious 
and we end with unconscious. So we're looking at this consciousness coming out into the world and going back into uh, the unconscious on the left. So in the middle, it's, it's a consciousness sandwich on the left side. You're going up consciousness to consciousness, and then it goes back. You only have a limited amount of consciousness at any one time, so maybe that's the way it works. On the right, we have 50% going up incompetence, and then you've got competence. So that is showing that step up to something new from A to B or A to Z. A being incompetence, Z being competence. Have you, has anyone seen this before? Type into the chat box. Its uh, its origin is of murky, uh, uh, murky, murky veracity. Um, <clears throat> people say it's a skills acquisition learning ladder from the 70s, basically. And there's a few names attached. I'm not even going to try to pin it down. Um, and I'll give you some links where you can find out more about it. So this is also a linear version of something that sometimes is more of a matrix. So uh, think of a skill you've learned. Can you trace it along this way? For example, riding a bike. Uh, when I was a kid, I didn't know much about, well, before I started riding bikes, I saw them around, but I had no real sense of it. I was unconsciously incompetent, I had unconscious incompetence. I didn't really know about it, couldn't do it. Then my dad bought me a bike, and, he, and I jumped on it before he could uh, help me, and I fell off. Um, I knew I wasn't any good. I needed dad to help me, hold me, hold the bike up, uh, put these training wheels on it. And I knew that I couldn't do it without the training wheels, so I was conscious of that. Uh, and I knew that, uh, so I was incompetent to actually ride a bike. And my dad, with practice, 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 he, he guided me. I practiced a lot with lots of support, feedback from him, uh, advice, and correction. I got to know that I was pretty good at it. I was like, hey, did someone asked me, can you ride a bike? I was like, yes, I can ride a bike. Eventually, stop talking about riding bikes, stop even trying to ride a bike, just ride bikes. We're just a person that rides bikes. I don't even have to think about it. I'm unconscious of my competence in this bike riding. I ride a bike. Uh, part of my uh, commute to work every day is riding a bike to the subway. I don't have to think about it. I'm unconsciously fully competent at the top of the ladder. Okay, these are the things. So I don't know anything about it. I can't do it. I know about it, but I can't do it myself. I can do it well if I'm deliberate. Yeah, I can do that if I try. Eventually, it's my ability. I'll do it naturally. Can you type into the chat box, think of a skill you've learned. I, I also was thinking about webinars, giving a webinar. First, I didn't know what a webinar was, any idea. I'm kind of in between. The, I, I'm very conscious that I'm incompetent at doing it. Uh, I made, made funnies in the, in the intro there. Uh, I was just test, was just uh, experimenting with buttons. Um, that's not really competence. Um, I also have uh, a whole bunch of notes that I need because I know that I need them. So I'm conscious of my incompetence. I'm conscious of a certain amount of competence too. So I'm in the middle of the ladder with giving a webinar. I'm certainly not at the top of the ladder yet. I can't do this without a lot of support, self-support scaffolds. Can anyone think of a skill that they've learned? Throw it in the chat box. Do you see how it might have gone, climbed up? Can you pin, pin it down in a few steps? Or... In Spanish, yes. Let's have a couple more skills. This is about language, but this also is a global sort of uh, concept here. Great, but it's clear with, with, with languages. All right, so let's, so let's move on. I actually take this as a intuition pump. If anyone's ever heard of Daniel Dennett, he's a philosopher. He's actually right down the street from here at Tufts University, and I read a book by him. I don't make a habit of reading a philosophy books, pretty slow going. But Daniel Dennett is pretty interesting. Um, this quote says, you can't do much carpentry without, with your bare hands. 
and you can't do much thinking with your bare brain. So you need some tools, some stratagems, some uh, what he's calling an intuition pump. Just make things work, make things make sense, um, Daniel Dennett says. So it's a kind of experiment. So I'm not presenting this as sort of the results of, of excellent research that I've done or anything like that. This is just something that pumps me, pumps my intuition, pumps my understanding, and I'll show you a bunch of ways that it does that. Um, in other intuition pumps, for me, uh, sometimes I like to, I remember um, doing an interview for a job recently, and they said, what's your philosophy of teaching? And I said, I'm a feedback machine. And that was a concept that just came up in the moment, and then I used it a lot. And I tell people at certain points in the lesson, you just have to be a feedback machine. You step out of your self, and you become a kind of feedback uh, my almost mechanistic, but you have to step out of your uh, another way of being to give sort of consistent, clear feedback, and that's what I uh, found that, that my, was helping my learners the most. Uh, the Johari window, things like the reflective cycle is an intuition pump for some people where it just helps things make sense. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pump. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nitro uh, shot of helping to think about things. Can anyone think of some kind of concept that really just helps you to launch into, and maybe it comes back like, oh, use me, use me. This ladder is one that constantly is coming back for me and trying to, and helping me make sense of pumping up my, my intuition, my understanding of things. Anyone got one? Any of these cycles or uh, metaphors for teaching would be an intuition pump for some people. So you approach class like it's a play, and there's a, there's a, there's a three-act play, and you're thinking about the, the shape of a lesson in terms of drama. And that would be an intuition pump. Nobody's got one, so I'll move on. So in this uh, presentation, um, looking at basically five areas where I bring this pump, I pump stuff up. Uh, Learning in the classroom through practice and feedback. And also looking at the lesson planning, lesson maps, and how, to, how I approach planning in a pre-flective way, so reflecting on planning as I plan things, a way to understand it better for me, because it's so hard for me. Number three is scaffolding the train, teach, trainee teacher's experience on the CELTA course, which is a very intensive four-week course. It's very, very intense. People need all the pumps that they can get to pump themselves up for all this stuff. And there's also non-native speakers on teacher training courses who often feel that they uh, are totally un, un, unconnected to any realities, that their strengths are cannot be used by themselves, by, by them, and recognized by other people in the best possible way. So that's part of it. And then finally, thinking about how this pumps me up to connect myself to learning and be mindful and connected to learners. Now, we just typed in the chat box for a long time. I just want to check, are we still moving along? Someone say, here, or I'm, I'm afraid I've lost the, oh, Fluency MC is typing. Let's do it. OK. Get back to my clicker. So, tracing learning and practice and corrective feedback. Practice, this is the ladder of practice. Practice is taking place in the middle of this ladder where we're bringing, the purpose of practice is to make incompetence more competent. You feel me? So, the power of practice and feedback is very well known in ELT, and I'll have to talk about all the research. Um, it's placed in CLT and in, so in all of what we do is very well known. John Hattie said that recently, that well, not so recently, that feedback was the number one important thing. It does work for a lot of things, so I like it. Now looking at practice, what comes before practice in a classroom? It's some sort of input or presentation of uh, exposure to the target language, meaningful context. Students need input and exposure to get something to practice. That's when consciousness comes in and there's this big fat 
part of the latter, which is being in a classroom, is studying. It's all about being conscious, becoming conscious. It's very cognitive. It's very uh, thought-oriented. But what makes it really work? Why be in a classroom at all to pump up your consciousness? What is it that does that? Uh, if consciousness is the lever which pulls incompetence up to competence for sk the skill building that we're talking about, how do we fill the tank of uh, consciousness? I would say so that it zaps incompetence, it helps it become competence. I would say uh, today that we're going to look at part of that corrective feedback. Right, something that Scott Thornberry talked about at the very beginning of this summer intensive that was so amazing. So uh, that's the pressure, that's the, that's the electricity that sparks the consciousness to work into, comp turn incompetence into com competence. These are tongue twisters here. It's a lot of very similar words. So, but there are some really big challenges in uh, the sort of, corrective feedback provision for a lot, in a lot of cases in the macro sense and in the micro sense of people's classrooms, right? Uh, some challenges include teachers' beliefs about the students. Um, for example, they may think that students, in fact, are, don't, do not want to be provided with corrective feedback or error correction. I like corrective feedback better. Um, corrective feedback, CF. Uh, in fact, many, many studies have shown that students are hungry for feedback on their, on their output. Teachers' beliefs in their own role are very much related to that, uh, which may be I'm a native speaker and my, my only role is essentially to provide a model. And they're going to get it when they get it. Um, uh, so no corrective feedback in that approach. Teachers' ability to provide actual insight. So as native speakers, and I'm thinking of particularly native speakers here, uh, we've got essentially perfect consciousness of our language and perfect, uh, well, no, we've got perfect competence in our first language, but our consciousness is only of a certain type, uh, especially if we have no teaching experience at all, which is the uh, experience, uh, the situation of many of my trainees. And fourthly, so they can recognize uh, errors, but they can't necessarily provide any feedback into why, it, well, it, why it's an error, and what would be the correction, and what's where, what's the gap between those, and what's that uh, learning teaching moment, learning moment in between the error and the and the desired uh, so what they call target structure, target language. And finally, we we'll just use this lab, this very intuition pump, this very concept framework for skills acquisition to talk about teachers' lack of skill in providing uh, CF. So task number five, can you think of the six well, most well-recognized types of immediate oral corrective feedback that are commonly made by teachers in classrooms when, while students are practicing? So the student might say, he has dog. What can a teacher do to provide that scaffolded, upgrading, consciousness-raising, information, a reaction. Yeah, you can put on the fight song and you can say, let's, let's duke it out. He has a dog. He has a dog. Oh. I need Buddy to help me out. I can't. I can't put, put on any more costumes. I need. I need a. I need a puppet. So there's a bunch of them. Uh, well, there's six of them really famously, and uh, Lister and Ranta or Leister and Ranta. I don't know how to say the name is uh, famous research on this, and, and many others. So these are some of the things that you guys are are putting out, uh, putting up on the on the chat box. So a, a dog. As a dog, uh, it's very uh, not explicit. It might just be seen as a conversational move, and we might move on. But it's also a potential a reformulation and potential uptake. Explicit correction, like Chuck was mentioning, without the fisticuffs. 
clarification request. Oh, sorry, what? I didn't understand. Uh, why didn't, so why didn't they understand? Well, I'm gonna have to say it differently. Metalinguistic feedback. Elicitation request. He has hmm? Hmm. repetition. He has a dog. Uh, yeah. So very famously, those are the six. And a lot of teachers, um, despite the fact that CF has been proven and shown in studies and really believed by lots of teachers to be a crucial tool in the language learning classroom, that a lot of teachers aren't particularly aware of the options. Um, of these, of all the ways that you can provide corrective feedback to learners, or have learners provide them to other learners, and indeed, if they learn how to do it. Um, so, getting a little bit ahead of myself. I gotta check my my own uh, scaffold here because I'm not fully unconsciously competent to go through this presentation. Um, where am I? Yes. So. In order for teachers to step up the ladder, they need input from unconscious com incompetence to conscious incompetence to know what it is that they may not be doing that they may want to do. So in order to do that, they need input, like we already talked about, and exposure uh, to get to that next level. Uh, I'm gonna put in the chat box the link to this fantastic video of a teacher, both uh, uh, narrating and uh, showing all six of these, I think it's all six, corrective feedback moves in a classroom, uh, and it's fantastic. And um, uh, it was shared at TESOL 15. Carol Numrich shared it in her session on corrective feedback. So, seeing good, uh, good. Corrective feedback live in action would be an excellent way to get started. Then what we have to do is actually become competent in this skill. So one way to do that, um, oops, oops, I'm uh, missing a slide. Uh, I think I'm missing a slide. Uh, my neighbor has a Harley. You probably can't hear me right now. Uh, I was going to ask you what the what would be needed to go from the this step conscious incompetence to conscious competence. And in the blank, um, you could have written uh, in the chat box both practice and feedback, which is the same thing that language learners need to, in those middle, from, to go from the second level to the third level and make incompetence competence. You need to practice, 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 but practice alone isn't good enough. You need feedback, you need corrections, you need someone to help you. You need uh, a ZPD, a more knowledgeable other, to, to help you up or anything like that. For teachers who need corrective feedback on corrective feedback in class, uh, I'm going to share a fan, oops, I'm going to share a fantastic resource that is, shows that in action. Um, something called coaching from the sidelines, which uh, was put into practice by a friend of mine, a colleague, Chris Mioli, who uh, did this, worked with teachers as a Department of State Language Fellow at the University of Central Asia and worked with teachers in their classrooms as they were um, uh, working on uh, their teaching skills. And he would provide immediate corrective feedback to the teachers in their classroom. I thought that was pretty darn cool. Um, and uh, I gotta change my slide. And I love his this quote from Chris where he introduces one of the videos which shows him doing this and he says the instructors in these videos display a quality inherent to world-class teachers namely they are willing to expose their improvement areas to learn and become even better teachers this is a celebration of their professionalism now imagine having someone in your classroom you're actually teaching your class coaching you from the sidelines pointing out uh, areas where you are you may be uh, unconsciously incompetent or consciously incompetent, you don't know how yet to do it, and he's giving you feedback. It's an amazing celebration of professionalism, an amazing proof of the professionalism of teachers who are willing to work with other teachers in the same way that learners work with their teachers. Because we never stop learning, that's what ITD, the ITDI is all about, and the phrase, anything we, I can do, we can do better, uh, shows that this is how we could work on that. So corrective feedback, here's another 
uh, uh, sort of ladder map. And it shows the steps from unconscious incompetence to conscious competence. And I love this way of looking at it. There's aha, consci consciousness about something, awareness about something. Ah. Then there's this ouch period where it's work to practice. It's work to recognize your incompetence, be conscious of incompetence, and stare it in the face and work on it and work on it and practice it until it becomes competent. Uh, more competent. And then finally, there's sort of a mastery or something like that. And it's this ouch uh, area that is why we have, think we have the fight song, because we need to fight through the learning process for ourselves and for our, our learners, and we can't avoid any ouch at all. So they say no pain, no gain. So task number seven for you guys which R word in the title of this talk can learners and teachers get into without enough quality corrective feedback and help? Whether you're a cheap learner or a teacher, we're not, we are not done learning. The teachers are always in training. And we could, not, we could call it, rather than corrective feedback, upgrade feedback. So it has no negative connotations. Which one of these is the result of a lack of engagement. Yes, she's got it. Uh, Julie's got it from Greece, all the way from Greece. We can all easily get and stay in ruts without enough quality feedback online, in the staff room, with ourselves if we reflect on our lessons. So it's just encouragement to keep doing that. If you do it, start doing it. If you don't, next. Could learners themselves actually use this intuition pump, this map of, learn, of a four-step learning process as a metacognitive scaffold in studying English? Hmm, what do you guys think? You could type yes, no, maybe, definitely, for sure, not, ever, or anything else you please in the chat box. And once I get a few answers, I'm going to review a specific instance when, as Judy might believe, uh, I have a wonderful textbook by Marnie, Professor Marnie Reed at Boston University, which actually has the learners at the beginning of the book. And this is the intro chapter. You can see those that four-step ladder. You can't read it. But it's walking the learners through how they're going to go from something they don't know that they know, they don't even know that they don't know it, to taking it in and not being able to do it, but being aware of that and working from that second step of there's English. I can't do that yet. I can do what I can do, but I can't do the next. And constantly pushing themselves forward, forward, forward until they get to the goal, which is that highest step of being able to do it, which is the dream of every, of every English language learner. Okay, so we've actually moved on. So that was practice and corrective feedback and right in the classroom looking at how it works according to this four-step ladder. Next, I'm, going to sh I'm showing you something. What do you think it might be? Now, keep in mind, I'm a teacher trainer. That's something I work with. Part of a document that I work with, that the trainee teachers work with every month. What do you think it is? I'll just put on my shades and wait. This is my fight song. Long enough, I got two minutes slides to go through. It's the lesson frameworks, part of the lesson frameworks, for we've got skills, uh, skills lesson frameworks on one side, systems lesson frameworks on the other. And uh, these are stagings and shapes of a lesson, which you could call the maps of the types of lessons. This being systems, vocabulary, grammar, functional language. What do you think might be behind there? It's three kinds, you know, it could work three ways to, to teach a vocabulary lesson or a grammar lesson or a functional lesson. What do you think they might be called each one? Can you, if you can read the slide, if you can't, you could enlarge it. And I'll just give you 30 seconds. Anyone who could type a guess 
if you can read those stages, what those type the sort of titles of those lesson maps might be. Once again, I shall don my shades. <laughs> I like a small goat in the zoo. Oh, look, I've got another. I like a tiger on the internet. It's safe and sound from the dentist. Oh, okay. So the answer is a test teach test framework, text based framework, and a situational framework. So take a, a vocabulary lesson might be taught in any three of these ways. This is what we're using as a scaffold for, for teachers in training to think about how they can stack up stages and put together a well logical, logically staged lesson. Okay, I just ran through it. Can you guys type in the chat box what those three were called? First to type in all three gets a visit from the tiger. Everyone's over on fa Facebook. Or maybe you're watching the videos that I link to. Aren't they great? Multiple attendees are typing. Here it comes. You got test, teach, test, text space, situational, Mark. I love you, Mark. There you go. Awesome, there are the answers. So those are three. That's not really the point. The point being, the the trainees often ask, so why, what are, what's the relationship of these two? The, I could teach a grammar lesson these three different ways. What's the point? And this actually comes back, and I come back to the latter, where I use it again to pump up an explanation for them. So all the lessons have chair, a clarification stage. You clarify the language, you make it clear to the learners using lots of different techniques on one end of the spectrum simply being standing there and explaining it to them on the other end of the spectrum of more of a guided discovery approach and then after that they have language to practice so we do the familiar controlled and maybe heading towards freer type of practice with of course feedback 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 so what is the difference between the three lesson types uh, and lessons generally it's the way that the target language is delivered and the way that consciousness, those first two steps, or the, the first two steps from unconsciousness and raising it into consciousness is done. Three ways, a test, see what they can do, let them at it. Uh, uh, they meet the target language and try to work it. A text, where they meet the target language in context or a situation where they see where the, where the language really lives in the real world. They get the clarification and together they're moving from unconscious incompetence up to conscious incompetence. Now it's time for practice. Practice from conscious incompetence to conscious competence. They need the practice. They need the feedback. So the lessons go up the ladder. Student walks in the room. They don't know what you're going to teach them. Uh, they know a lot, but they, you're going to take them that one more step, the I plus one, and they're going to have an aha moment somewhere in the first beginning or slash middle of the lesson. They may have an ouch moment where incompetence is front and center. Everyone can feel it. And they're like, oh man, look at this. I want to improve. And there's a little bit of ouch and it's okay. Love the ouch because no pain, no gain. And finally, they get a taste within even just a single lesson. If you take them through a process where they can get a taste and they can get freer practice and personalize it, use it authentically, work with it in a more realistic way. They can get a taste, of actual just a taste of mastery. Moments of, I love it, Julie. Moments of mastery. Moments of mastery. That's the goal. Can anyone, now the arrows are a clue, but generally, if it's a 50 minute lesson, where do we, ideally, where do we want the most most of those 50 minutes to be in, assuming that the, the parts previous that worked and brought what they needed to bring to the lesson. 
yeah, up there, up there between three and four, between two, three, and four. If we're stuck in one, uh oh, if we're stuck in two, next class, to three, well done, to four, love you, teacher. Um, so in a 15 minute lesson, it might look something like this. Of course, the, there's no prescriptive uh, thinking about this. But thinking also in terms of that even by the end, they're still getting feedback and the previous, it's, a, it's washing forward. So here's a, what I really like about this ladder is imagining and framing, tracing uh, teacher learning in this process. Um, thinking about, I'm a Celta trainer, I'm watching people do the first six lessons of their lives, oftentimes, uh, in a language classroom especially native speakers here. We're going to talk about non-native speakers shortly. Native speaker comes in. I know English. I speak English. I speak English. I know English. Familiar to me when I first started and I thought, Whew, I got, I am so, I'm, I am the man for this job. Teach English. I go all around the world teaching English. Why? Why am I, why am I the man for this job? Ha, I know English already really well. Uh, you can't see the guy's face because his head's in the clouds a little bit. Uh, maybe he doesn't realize there's going to be a learning process. You're going to have to go down some steps, not stay where you are on the top. Uh, that's the uh, not native speaker teacher's pretension, so to speak. I'm on top. I can do this because I speak English. I know I speak English. They don't realize that right at the bottom, in terms of being a teacher, they... They have unconscious, perfect competence as a native speaker, but as a teacher, they have unconscious income. They don't even realize how little they really know about English. And they're like a fish in a fishbowl, uh, ready to teach other, other people about water. Very difficult. Uh, so in the process of doing their teaching practice lesson on the present perfect or whatever it might be, present perfect continuous, they have to take a step down and become consciously competent. So more than just a native speaker who says, uh, that's the way it works. Why? What is it? Consciousness of the errors of why, what's right, what's wrong, what is this called? They have to get quite thoroughly down into the language of their lesson and really analyze it to get further. A big part of that is anticipating the problems, anticipating the, the misunderstandings that a learner might have. So they've even got to dip down a step further into conscious incompetence and visualize what it's like to not have English as a first language, to not have perfect unconscious, any unconsciousness about it that actually works as, co as competence, but have consciousness but without, with incompetence. They have to they have to ask themselves, what is it like? What is it not? What is it really? What is it to someone who has no, that does not have this language built into their brain? And this is why if you ask any CELTA trainee, they stay up until four o'clock in the morning, almost every day of the CELTA course. I swear to God, the LA sheets are things that metastasize and grow into this amazingly difficult and challenging uh, experience for a lot of uh, native speaking teachers who are doing an initial teacher training course like the CELTA. There's an assignment on the CELTA called Focus on the Learner, and with every lesson, the students, the trainees, are, need to focus on the learner, meet the learner where they're at, and go all the way down to that level, and, and uh, analyze their language, anticipate the problems, come up with strategies to help those learners and the, all of the learners in their classroom, and design, create, adapt meaningful practice activities learn how to do uh, corrective feedback. CCQs are extremely helpful. And if you, when you ask a CCQ, you're seeing if they know that you know that they know that you know that they understand that what the thing actually is. And there's a sense of consciousness, 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 shared consciousness by asking a CCQ when you're using that leverage. So uh, ideally we get them well, they push them all the way up to those experiences, those moments of mastery where the teacher's pushing them. And my, uh, my clip art uh, figures are, are moving up the ladder together. Our teacher's got to come down first. Test number nine. Can you describe, can you think of something that you've seen your own students uh, 
take through conscious incompetence to conscious competence recently? What have you been working on? And it's a very simple question, really, just but think in terms of incompetence and competence. Have you witnessed someone going up to the next step? What was it? Can you write a note? So, yeah, nice discourse markers. And so you see them kind of bubbling up. There's lots of other students, of course, never get things completely right first. First, it's a 30% success rate. And then where they need it, they don't have it. And then it's just going up and up. And maybe this is less a step, a staircase than a uh, sort of smooth, smooth upward facing wave or some sort of slidey thing. And we can't say that they're on this step or that step. Usually we're climbing in between steps. That's great. Um, now flip it and think about your own teaching skills. Obviously we're here because we're thinking about our teaching skills. What have you, what's one thing that in the past so long you've become competent, you've used your, you've become conscious of it. So for example, for me, and then become more competent. For me, um, it's using colors on the whiteboard. I never really thought about using different colors for specific things until I read a blog post by Tefo Geek or somebody like that. And he was saying, I use red for corrections and green for this, blue for that. And I said, oh, wow, that's cool. So I became conscious of it. Had no real skill in that. And I fumbled with it a bunch of times because I'm not used to keeping markers in organized places in the room. And I would just, not, I had to practice. I had to figure out how to keep my markers and Think, think in the lesson about which marker needs what when I grab it. And it becomes relatively competent, but I still have to think about it quite a lot. And maybe one day it'll become a habit. Can anyone think of a different area of teaching where they've recently made progress in developing skill? With this, with this crowd, it shouldn't be too hard. Hey, Chris Mioli. I'll put my hat back on. I'm going to listen to the theme song in my head for a few more seconds. I'm not going to wait much longer. Right. So, thinking about that, it's really important for us to think about as teachers our, our consciousness and our competence when it comes to teaching skills. Now, back to trainees on a really intensive initial teacher training course. I use this in a sense to scaffold trainee teachers learning process on an extremely intensive certificate course by introduce, essentially doing nothing more than just introducing the concept, sometimes in completely in passing. I sketch it on the board and say, by the way, this is sort of, this might be helpful. And oftentimes it takes with a lot of learners, it takes really instantly because it's a pump. It's a very intuitive pump. It's an intuition pump that I think kind of gets in there a lot of people's minds because it's so intuitive. There's so much going up the ladder for CELTA trainees, for teacher trainers, for us as teachers, professional teachers, it's a little slower process, but there's still a lot that we're trying, always trying to work on going up the ladder. And uh, it's hard. So they need, they need intuition pumps to help them uh, process these things. I don't have any, I don't yet haven't developed any sort of systematic sort of a handheld form or anything. I'm just thinking about how they could actually um, trace and track their progress with different skills. So one, one typical thing is well-graded teacher talk, which is what TT means, teacher talk. And I like this version of the conscious competence uh, cycle because it shows this dip because so what what I could what I might do and that shows a realistic kind of ah you become you, first you have to go down before you go up right so you have to be bad at something before you can be good at something I think we can all get with that um, because you have to know about it and realize that you can't do it or that you do it not not as well as you would like to before you can do it well um, 
So I like this idea of perhaps putting uh, different teaching skills into these slots. So how unconscious were you of this thing that you don't know how to do? So did you know coming in that teachers needed to be super conscious of their teacher, of the quality and the, the, the amount, and perhaps more, even more importantly, or just as importantly, the quality of their teacher, the, the words that they use throughout the lesson? Someone might say, well, sort of, that, kind of. We're thinking about that as a starting point. Then they might uh, pinpoint the TP means teaching practice, and typically these people on this course get nine of those, and they might be able to pinpoint where they became consciously incompetent um, of this particular thing. Where was that low point which would herald their, their progress forward? That might be helpful. Um, then where do they feel like they became conscious of, of a skill that they've developed? And then finally at the end, um, it could be them or it could be another person that fills this out to show them, because they may be unconscious of it, what they've done that they may not realize that they did to show that they were um, competent um, and not even aware that they did it like that. And actually that happens a lot with trainees. Just yesterday everyone was praising someone for making the students laugh and laughing along with them a little bit, or at least making the students laugh a lot. And she had no idea that that was something that she had begun, just begun to do without even realizing it. So that'd be a scaffold. Now, secondly, uh, speaking of non-native speakers, we also have those on the, these teachers on the course, and thank God because uh, it would be not so fun with full of native speakers only. Um, I like to say we're the niche. Non-native speakers are the thing. Um, what do you think? Is this true or false? Write T or F in the chat box, everyone. I agree. There's lots of things. What else comes to mind? Um, I was reminded by James of James Taylor's post from 2014, why I wish I was a non-native teaching speaking teacher. What else comes to mind? What are the strengths of the non-native speaking teacher that a lot of native speaking teachers may not may have more work to do? to actually become some skillful or have all these awarenesses or skills. I'm waiting for one person, identify with students for culture, nice, yes. So here's a few. Second, provide a role model for specific examples, uh, sp aspects of the language and clear intelligible pronunciation. So we're talking about EFL, EL, EF, ELF and things like that. Um, anticipating the problems which is what Anastasia was essentially saying. Understanding and using the L1. So uh, Syke, uh has poetry in many languages. He's a multilingual person. He's such an incredible resource. Um, culture is there, like Fluency MC just mentioned, and uh, global culture, global culture even. So if this person wearing the pink shirt is the uh, represents the non-native speaker. What do you think uh, the message of this slide might be? So I'm thinking that they're they're all over the map. They have. They're, they are spread out um, uh, throughout the levels in, in an extremely uh, helpful, resourceful, um, advantageous way. So they become a role model. They have ex excellent language awareness, empathy, and often, uh, more often than not, share the language of the learners in their classroom. So uh, this is a, this ladder is a way to show um, native speakers uh, how that how their strengths are stretched throughout these really important things. And if they see the light, the this skills process and everything else on the same ladder, um, this ladder is such a this concept is so uh, universal and brings together so many things. I think that's why it's intuitive, or it's intuitive because of that. Um, it really can help. So finally, just thinking about coupling teaching and learning putting these things on the same scale, on the same ladder, you're with your students learning, teaching, 
they're learning a language, uh, they're learning learning. And being mindful and being empathetic with your learners, especially when everyone is at a, is conscious of incompetence. I mean, we're all in it together. And we all know that we need to, we want to improve. So sometimes in this uh, ladder, you'll see a fifth step, which is the purple one, right? Yeah. Mind. So you're unconsciously competent. What next? Is it just, is it over? Potentially you could think about becoming again, conscious of the competence again, but in a different way, uh, a mindful way you are fully with it. You don't let it slip back into uh, incompetence as quickly. Although all, all skills obviously decay um, without uh, support, feedback, and ongoing evolution, um, but sensitive to opportunities, and context could be thought of as the final step. Also, this ladder is, is seen as a matrix oftentimes, and so that from stage one, unconsciously incompetent, going around or up the ladder to stage four, once we're unconsciously competent of something, we're not working on it anymore, we're not conscious of it, it may indeed, and it does indeed slide back, and we lose the skills that we once had, it slides back to stage one, and it goes around like this instead of just that's more realistic. Um, there's a video of this particular um, uh, conception of this uh, on this playlist, along with lots of other videos that I just uh, I just found on YouTube about this uh, particular skills acquisition ladder concept. Okay, wrapping it up. I think of this intuition pump similarly as I think as I use things like the reflective skills, reflective uh, cycle, reflective cycle, the ELC here. Um, I think it works quite well with those and pumps up the ability to reflect on uh, experiences, uh, conceptualize, experiment, and have more experiences. So we got a few minutes left. What do you think this ladder might mean to you? Does it pump your intuition or inspire you in some way? And are there any questions? Make sure you ask the man some questions. Yes, Mark, the, the same letter. So there's a, there's a picture. I, I found some pictures. I guess they didn't make it into my slides of people on ladders helping each other up. And I could uh, think of those images <clears> of <throat> two people on a ladder. One's reaching down, one's reaching up. And it's just, a, it's just a fantastic image for me because it's so often the case that we, we do conceive of teachers and learners sort of on a different uh, uh, axis. And I just, I love the idea of taking the word incompetence out of its evaluative judgmental uh, connotation completely and sort of stripping it of any of this negativity and adding consciousness to it and looking at, okay, well, conscious, I want to be conscious, which is fantastic connotations for me, the word conscious and incompetence, which becomes a really sort of, it still has teeth because it's impossible to get you're incompetent. It's, a, it's impossible to get that that kind of sharpness out of that word. But uh, using it along with in this framework, I really I re, it really works for me. <laughs> yeah. So um, and I, as I mentioned on the on the teacher training course. I'll sometimes I'll, I'll really just do this in passing, and it'll keep coming up with learners saying, or teach trainers, learners, they're learning, teaching, they're learners, the, the, the teacher learners saying saying things out of the blue, like, yeah, I was, yeah, last lesson I was really, 
uh, I didn't realize until I got the feedback that was happening. But now I'm totally consciously incompetent. So I'm really looking forward to working on it because I'm so conscious of it. And now I can work on it. I'm like, wow, you really take, you really took to this. Like you're on the ladder. You're talking about ladders, and and I'm, I didn't even, you know, well, I should bring in, I should just bring in a ladder and stick it in the corner of the room, and everyone, no one can ever forget about it. So that's why I call it the intuition pump. Um, like Daniel done it, because uh, it pumped. It's just I'm pumped when I when I use it to think about various things in teaching and learning. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Matthew. That was just great. Yeah, the really noticing good. the whole noticing hypothesis and second language acquisition and uh, is is a fantastic uh, connection to make. Um, Other comments? Well, questions? thanks everyone. Matthew, fabulous presentation. Thanks, Barb. That means a lot coming from you. Wonderful stuff. Brought me back to Celta days. I have to put on my shades, which I noticed that these, I, I really don't like wearing um, dark glasses. And that's why I actually have so many, because when I really need them, I have to buy them because I don't um, carry shades around with me. And then and these these ones happen to match the, that orange color of ITDI. So I'm going to put on my ITDI That's shades. I think we this is the color in the logo. Especially for the last session. It's really good. Yeah, I wish when I'd done self very, very I had some of those insights. I wish you Thanks, could. Thanks, everyone. What I wish. I'm going to move into the chat box and then say goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Thank I'm going to turn off my mic. Okay, fabulous presentation. But, uh, oh, but if we're going to yeah, play the song, the song, I'm going to have to join in with you guys. Of course, we're going to play the song. You don't get out of here without the song. Yeah. I'll just leave it on the recording. Yeah, I hear some echo, but maybe it's just me. Those of, you, those of you who are watching the, the recording, this is the official ending of the uh, presentation, but if you'd like to hang around and watch Michael, or watch Matthew and Fluent CMC dance and me, <laughs> you're welcome to do it. Thank you everybody for, for being here. It's been a fabulous evening for me, who could have been a morning for you. Don't forget tomorrow, we have uh, Andy Boone, who I like to call the hardest working man at ELT. He's always, presenting somewhere, writing some book, or he's, he's just a, I mean, he's a great presenter. Then we have our own Mr. Stephen Herter, director, founder of ITDI, along with Barbara and my, myself and some others, Gareth Knight. That's a fine picture. As well, it's going to be another great day. Yeah. And Stephen's got a lot. Andy's pick, yeah, it's making me hungry too. So, and also, don't forget that all the recordings for the past sessions are, are available. And Matthews will be up very, very soon. So do watch them and make use of them and spread the word about, about this. Oh.